You are online in three. Two, one. You are online now. Muy buenas tardes. Seguimos en nuestra programación del Global Congress de Propiedad Intelectual e, e Interés Público. Y bueno, ya han visto que tu, fue, ha sido una programación intensa, pero supremamente interesante. Para el día de hoy, y como una de las eh, conferencistas principales, tengo el gran honor y placer de presentarles a la profesora Ruth Okedigi. Es, no estoy segura nunca de cómo decir su apellido, pero Ruth es una profesora de la Facultad de Leyes de la Universidad de Harvard, es la Jeremy Smith. Junior, profesor, eh, ocupa esa, esa cátedra y es la codirectora del, C del Centro Berkman para Internet y Sociedad. La profesora Okeji tiene una amplia hoja de vida que me ha dicho que mantenga corta, de modo que yo simplemente voy a agregar que compartimos juntas eh, dentro del, de la Junta Directiva de Creative Commons y que es una de las profesoras que admiro más en este momento en los temas en los que ella es una experta y de los que, por supuesto, nos va a compartir algo en los próximos minutos. Los dejo para escuchar a la profesora Ruth Okejiti hablarnos sobre derecho de autor en medio de la pandemia. Muchas gracias, Ruth. Thank you so much, Carolina, for that gracious um, introduction and I want to thank everyone who has joined in for um, this session of the Global Congress. Uh, thank you for those who are watching at the late hours of the night in different parts of the world or the very early hours of the morning in other parts of the world. I have a few minutes to share some thoughts with you this afternoon in, in my part of the world and I've decided to give a presentation on what I am calling copyrights public health crisis. Let me begin first with thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, this semester is the first time uh, since the pandemic began that I have taught in person on campus. And Although it is wonderful to be back amidst the busyness and the excitement of the students, I can't help but think about the ways in which the world has changed. The ways in which the very act of teaching and learning, especially teaching and learning copyright law, has shifted. All over the world, we've ushered in a new era of employment, healthcare and education. All of these changes in these areas come with significant questions and implications for copyright law. Contract law also has implications and implications for technology regulation. We are now intensely occupied in an effort to remake our sense of collective governance and what it should mean politically and economically and culturally. This effort is happening at the local, national and multilateral levels. The virus in short has reinforced what I view as a key feature of our material well-being, namely that the efficacy of our policies to improve human flourishing requires, it indeed, let me say it demands types of law that assume collective engagement as the context in which individual pursuits are made possible and even meaningful. So the question really is what does it mean to own a book in the pandemic? What does copyright enforcement even look like when we are dealing with a public health emergency? Does society benefit from our enforcement and recognition of the benefits of copyright? Or does enforcement hurt authors and, and ultimately publishers and the public? 
As Professor Julie Cohen has observed in one of her remarkable books, Reconfiguring the Network Self, the regulation of knowledge production and of knowledge goods that were emphasized at the onset of the internet has really highlighted cultural production as the most salient aspect of the networked information society. In much the same way, copyright law is often positioned as primarily an engine of authorial production. In other words, the, the, the reason and the focus and the energy of copyright law is directed as one principally geared to produce authorial creativity. With the internet, scholars celebrated the new patterns of cultural participation that digital technologies enabled, including a greater capacity for expressive liberty and market exchange. And these things were viewed as the ultimate ends. But again, are we benefited by viewing copyright in this way? What we have lacked is an overarching purpose for the new superpowers that have made copyright an intimate life partner and a central legal regime for the average citizen. Technology is pervasive. Content on technology is pervasive. Technological devices have become the principal way in which we engage with one another for political, economic, and even leisurely ends. And everything that we touch, everything that we experience online and offline involves this use, intense use of knowledge. And yet we have really lacked this overarching purpose for much of our discourse about copyright. And if we're going to give copyright superhero powers, if copyright is going to be like a Superman or a Wonder Woman, then what every superhero needs is a villain. In fact, it's the villain that makes the superhero. Every villain's destructive ideas and intentions are what give definition to why and how a superhero's powers must transcend and redeem the good of all people. So if copyright is a superhero, what's the villain? What's the villain that defines and limits and conscribes what copyright law should look like? I want to suggest here that the overarching purpose of copyright law is to produce a society of individuals that are fully capable of active engagement as users and contributors, active engagement in the cultural, social, and economic fabric of their defined geographic space. In other words, copyright is an enabler of social formation and not a disabler of social formation. Copyright is an enabler of political and cultural identity and not a disabling tool of the very things that make us a public. So how do we get to this place? How, how do we get to this place where we view copyright law as a tool of social and cultural formation? Because copyright as we know it today is primarily an architect um, an architecture of control. Copyright controls creativity. It controls access. It controls distribution. This was, of course, not the original incarnation of copyright law. And as Article 7 of the TRIPS Agreement suggests, copyright law, as with other intellectual property law, has a public purpose, has a set of objectives that are intended to drive us to this idea that we live in a collective environment and that the nourishing and progress of that collective environment is what constitutes public welfare and the public good. The original incarnation of copyright law focused on the importance of education as an essential element of human flourishing. And over the years, we have adapted and shifted this view of copyright law. Mm -hmm. And in my view, this idea of balancing between creators and users has become a challenge. 
And it's a challenge because we now have an anemic, impoverished view of the ecosystem in which copyright superpowers are supposed to work. You see, prior to the pandemic, the activities of users and creators and intermediaries were, to quote Professor Cohen, detached from material and geographic contexts. Owners and users were just individuals, atoms. They were independent. They were not related to any common goals or any common boundaries. Now, this is not really the fault of the copyright industries. It is, in fact, the market exchange and the expressive ideas that are central to copyright and to its justifications that have nourished the idea that the target of copyright's incentives is a writer who writes for herself and a reader who reads to herself. Each author or reader was a self-contained autonomous agent of culture. But of course, we know that this is not true. We know this because even Article 8, which expresses principles of the TRIPS agreement, makes very clear that things like public health and nutrition and other areas um, of the public interest in sectors that are of, of, of vital importance are supposed to be taken into account when we design national copyright law. The pandemic thus has portrayed a very different account it has called into question the idea that every author is a self-contained autonomous agent of culture, or that every reader is a self-contained independent agent of culture. It turns out that the productive economy requires communities of people with wide access to the tools of learning, the tools of experiencing, and the tools of speaking in order for progress to really happen. To advance the public interest, we require whole communities or the institutions within those communities to have access. And this is an access that must be simultaneous, an access that is quick, and an access that is easily distributed. Copyright law and theory is really unprepared for this shift. And copyright law, quite frankly, may not have the DNA that is necessary to adapt and evolve to meet the sense of urgency that invariably is attached to improving the ways in which we pursue welfare objectives as part of the governance of the production of knowledge goods, and especially when communities are in crisis. As we prepare to enter our third year touched by this pandemic, and to work our way through the many variants of the virus and to think about how we adjust to a new world of remote work, remote health and remote education, we are confronted with the ways that the current copyright regime fundamentally interferes with the human instinct to preserve life, the human instinct to survive in the face of threats, and most importantly, the human instinct to save others as we save ourselves along the way. It turns out that copyright law may be an incomplete and incompatible legal tool to govern welfare goals under conditions that demand progress, notwithstanding risks and hazards that surround us. Let me provide just a few examples of the level of crisis and urgency that are related to the public welfare challenge of copyright law. As of April 2021, UNESCO reported that 90% of the world's enrolled students have been adversely affected by the pandemic. And it's unclear when limitations that have interfered with the education of children will fully be lifted. One year into this pandemic, we are still dealing, or one year into the COVID-19 pandemic, close to half of the world's students were still affected by partial or full closures of schools, and over 100 million additional children will fall below the minimum proficiency level in reading as a result of the health crisis. Is it unquestionable? Can we deny that there is a crisis, a public health crisis in copyright. 
and that this crisis is related to not only the health and well being of children and teachers and schools, but that the very essence of copyright, the improvement of education, has also been disrupted. All of a sudden, without warning, there was an unexpected need to share, to transmit, to distribute, to copy, and to make available at a scale for which copyright law simply has not been designed. So what does it mean to own a book in the pandemic? What does it look like to enforce copyright in a pandemic? Now, it was always the case that some remote access to, to information was always available on a routine basis, even within an emergency context. Often, many turned to the fair use doctrine. And at least one case, the Hatchet versus Internet Archive case, is going to give us a view of what fair use looks like in the context of access to books in the midst of a pandemic. But before I go into the Hatchet uh, versus Internet Archive case, I want to remind us of the existing exceptions and where we're headed. We have the fair use doctrine. We have exemptions in certain countries for educational uses. We have the Marrakesh Treaty exceptions. We have the Byrne Appendix for compulsory licensing for mass production of books. We have regular types of compulsory licenses. We have liability rules, the possibility that we can use the works and then agree at a negotiated compensation at a later time. The question is, do we need a public health exception to copyrights existing exceptions? In the Internet Archive case, this is a case from the Southern District of New York, brought by four of the world's largest publishers against Internet Archive. Now, when you think about the copyright rationale, the existing rationale for copyright protection, remember that copyright does not envisage a direct role to the public interest. It has historically, in modern history, been indirect. As I said, in the beginning, copyright law had the public interest very firmly in its view. The horizon of the public interest was the thing for which copyright law was directed. Copyright was a means to an end. It was not an end in itself. But as market exchange and expressive liberty interests have become the focal point of copyright's justifications, as the utilitarian ethos has overtaken copyright law, we find that the public interest is only indirectly implicated. The assumption, I argue, is that many think that just by existing, just by having a copyright regime as an incentive for authorial creativity, that this is presumptively in the public interest. Now we know that copyright does not generally govern all activities such as the private reading of works or the transfer and lending of works, although this can differ from country to country. The same human instinct that fueled a no registration requirement in the Berne Convention remains strongly present in our persistence in the protection of moral rights. So this idea that we are human and that there's a human instinct and a human liberty that is expressed through creative works remains very strong. And the question is why does it remain strong only on an individual basis rather on, than on the basis of a collective? Because the educational goal was so heavy and so directly in focus at copyright's origins, I would argue that the DNA of copyright has always been to keep the collective public interest in mind, whether we were in a crisis or outside of a crisis. And so we see that this fair use doctrine which by the way is heavily tied to educational uses and is described as the most troublesome doctrine in copyright law in the US has become the go-to exit, the go-to mechanism to facilitate access even in the midst of a pandemic. Many of us know that it consists of a four factor tests that allows us to balance goals. The idea is to allow equitable interests to be vindicated by proving 
the necessity of the use, the validity of the use, the integrity of the use, in light of the nature and the interests of the copyright owner. Now, we've already, prior to the Internet Archive case, we've already seen that courts, at least in the US, and through the work of organizations like Charisma and, 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 and conversations globally that are occurring, such as the Global Congress, that the idea that copyright only exists to vindicate individual economic interests has come into some disrepute. We first began to see glimpses of this in the uh, Hathi Trust litigation. Many of us are familiar with the Hathi Trust litigation. In that case, the court ruled that the doctrine of fair use allows libraries to digitize copyrighted works um, and permit full text searches, um, and in particular, to allow people with disabilities to have access to those works. Now, to me, this is where we began to see the origins of a public health um, exception to copyright. The fair use doctrine, the court said, is inexpensive without question available for the work that the Hathathos Library was engaged in. The court said, although I read the judge, said that although I recognize that the facts here are without precedent, and this just made so much sense to me as I recalled the kind of pandemic circumstance in which the internet archive case is emerging. The court there, the judge, basically said, I cannot imagine a definition of fair use that would not encompass the transformative uses made by the, um, by the defendants in this case and would require that I terminate this invaluable contribution to the progress of science, the cultivation of the arts, and at the same time, ignore the ideals espoused by the Americans with Disabilities Act. When you just look at what the judge said in the Authors Guild case, first, the judge acknowledges the unprecedented nature of the case in front of him. This was a case about scale. This was not an individual photocopying, scanning, or doing one thing at a time. This was mass reproduction at scale. And we began to see, as the court said, we cannot even imagine we can't imagine a definition of fair use that doesn't encompass this kind of activity. And my view is that that language and the, the court's genuine and profound discomfort that copyright law would ignore or diminish or remove the possibility for people who are disabled and, 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 and others who may have difficulty accessing materials, the copyright law would be content and satisfied with a world in which a discrete group of disadvantaged people might not have access. The court could not imagine a legal regime that would facilitate that. And so fair use became the exit man. I think it's important to see that the Authors Guild decision was not just a decision about fair use. And this is my argument this afternoon, that this was a decision pointing copyright back to its public welfare horizon. It wasn't just about individual users, but it was about a society in which certain people would not have access to the very essence of what was necessary to make them productive individuals and flourishing citizens within our society. And one of the concerns that I have about describing this as fair use, rather than seeing this as an integral part of copyright's architecture, is that exceptions, including fair use, can merely be a way of shaping conduct along lines beneficial to authors and owners rather than beneficial to the public. As I said earlier, copyright has become an architecture of control, control of access, control of use, control of dissemination, control of the forms and the ways and the limits and the amounts that can be disseminated at any one time. And our reliance on fair use is fueling 
that architecture of control because by definition, fair use is used by use. It is ad hoc. It is inherently unstable. It is unpredictable. And as much as I support and am a fan of fair use, it strikes me that in a time of a public health crisis, if fair use is our principal tool to facilitate access by those who need it at the scale at which it is needed, as quickly as it is needed, and the capacity to disseminate seamlessly, we are impoverishing this very tool on which we rely. As Professor Cohen notes, networked information technologies mediate our interactions and our perceptions. They, they affect the ways in which we understand our own capabilities and our relative boundedness. And so if we are depending on an ad hoc tool or a tool useful principally in ad hoc situations, use by use, are we not in fact failing to understand the ways in which fair use as an exception at a time when massive access is required might reinforce our boundedness. Let me give an example. Within the context of ensuring access to education during the pandemic, there are, there are really three major ways in which we justify fair use in the educational context. We think of fair use with large individual students or individual teachers using the materials. We think in the context of face-to-face -face instruction um, and sometimes even in virtual um, instruction. In essence, these exceptions have been negotiated and we find ourselves teaching in the classroom, we find students learning in the classroom, having to fit their teaching and fit their learning to these particular expressions of fair use in the educational space. Exceptions allow for the use of a work without requesting permission, but they define a limited range of ways in which we can do it. And many times the range of ways in which this can be done are inconsistent with this vision that we saw begin to be articulated in the Hathi Trust decision. Fair use balances the interests of users and owners. It does so in discrete and important ways, but nowhere in there is the public as a collective reflected. That balancing between users and owners assumes only two groups of people and that individuals fall in either one category or another category. It does not envisage, nor does it depict a society in which we have users, owners, and a collective that must cohere within a democratic environment. Fair use balances these interests. It assumes disparate rather than a collective interest in access to copyrighted works. We all know the balances and the factors of fair use, but what we should see is that in the context of the pandemic, many, many uses emerged that would also have to populate our fair use understanding of what is a fair use for purposes of education. The Copyright Clearance Center provided a list um, in its report that print photocopying vastly increased because students lost access to materials in, in the online environment. Online learning platforms and other tools gained tractions. Publishers were having to create no cost licenses because teachers had to teach under these new environments. Many assessment tools for learning moved online. In other words, there was a dynamic change that required dynamic access to copyrighted content. Fair use was not in that setting, being indeterminate, being ad hoc, being individually focused was not going to be the most robust way to obtain access in the moment. Determining whether a particular use is fair is heavily fact dependent, we know this. And the same activity might be fair use in one day, but not fair use in another way. It might be fair use in one jurisdiction, it might not be fair use in another 
jurisdiction. A teacher might need to photocopy her, her article for student distribution, but if she asks for those copies to be made by a for-profit uh, uh, photocopying uh, 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 business, it might no longer be fair use. In other words, we find that fair use stability is not something that educators could rely upon in the context of a scaled up need for access. I think it's critical as we begin to look for what happens in the outcome of the Internet Archive case to consider how we think about the ways in which in the context of an emergency, a public health emergency that by definition limits human contact, how do we respond to the needs of educators and the needs of institutions who must adapt the educational environment in its dynamism, in its, in its creativity, uh, how do we diminish the inequalities that COVID-19 exacerbated during its height in the context of education. The urgency with which schools needed to pivot to online learning, many argue led to short-term lack of compliance with copyright. And many describe these as tolerated infringements. I think we need to think about whether these are tolerated really, or whether in fact copyright anticipates and is justifiably protective of the kinds of uses that occurred in the context of the pandemic. Now already in December, 2020, the World Intellectual Property Organization met for the first time during the pandemic. It convened the 40th session of the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. And really the most important thing that happened uh, during the SECR um, was this push for copyright rulemaking to address these diverse and critical needs in the context of, of the pandemic. Some argued that the pandemic has shown more clearly than ever that copyright can stand in the way of libraries and of schools and of teachers and of cultural heritage institutions um, from properly operating. Copyright exceptions that currently exist, they argued, do not meet these needs. Now, before the pandemic, there was already a trend towards digital and cross-border access and use of copyrighted materials. But these uses were not codified. Um, they were not deemed to be at a scale high enough to justify rulemaking until the pandemic, of course, that emerged. Those conditions have clearly shifted. And it is now the new reality that institutions all over the world are opting for remote and hybrid forms of educational delivery, research access, and the dissemination of knowledge. And it is clear that we may never go back to the way it used to be. So what is fair use going to look like in a context such as this? This case, the Internet Archives case, turns on many issues that I've already touched on in this lecture. It was brought by four major publishers who filed a lawsuit to stop the Internet Archive from digitizing and lending books to the public. And these publishers demanded that this nonprofit library destroy the 1.5 million digital books that it had made. What is at stake in the Internet Archives case is important. It is, of course, the task of libraries to make words works available to the broad public. The model is the basis of a practice, this owning to load or own to load, which has been something the libraries have been doing um, um, in order to ensure that once books are digitized, there's some sort of controlled lending. The digitization of physical books, lending them on a one-to-one -one basis, controlled digital lending. Now, this was at the core of the National Emergency Library Initiative under which the Internet Archive unilaterally made its collection available for unlimited borrowing during the pandemic. The temporary collection of books that were available were about 4 million, many were in the public domain, but it really was that students and independent scholars could come and feast at this table of knowledge. <clears throat> 
publishers objective, uh, objected. They were not on board with this initiative. And they compared the Internet Archives efforts to the world's largest pirates. And they want damages for infringement. They want the scanning program shut down. They want the infringing, the allegedly infringing scans destroyed. Now, let me just say for those who, who may be curious, this is roughly equivalent to a medium sized library. The New York Public Library, by comparison, holds 21.9 million books and printed materials and 178 million ebooks, roughly, according to data that may be a little dated now. So when you're talking about what the publishers want destroyed, it is the equivalent of a, mid a medium sized library. What's more is that the publishers are hesitant to sell ebooks to libraries. This is what's ironic. They're hesitant to sell ebooks to libraries, instead, in, insisting instead on a temporary license. And we, we understand and we know this pre pandemic that this was the way. But libraries historically have always been central figures in the copyright ecosystem. It was never copyright versus libraries or copyright versus librarians. In fact, libraries have always had the right to buy and to lend books, which is the core of their mission. So why stop now? The Internet Archive wants to buy eBooks, but can't buy eBooks under the new business model of publishers. It wants to lend single copies of works to all, but can't under the new business model. And so this lawsuit, many supporters argue, is a suit to stop learners from accessing the millions of digitized works that are available in their library. Now, in its defense, Internet Archive has raised fair use. The question is whether or not controlled digital lending is within the fair use orbit or external to it. In other words, should controlled digital lending work in an environment in which fair use parallel works with it or works with it in parallel? Because the question then is if libraries are limited to controlled digital lending, if contracts limit their capacity to make works available to the public, the question then is what is the role of fair use in a privately constructed space done by contracts. These constraints facing libraries are crucial, but they're crucial not just because they become bottlenecks of access for the public, they're crucial because they eliminate an essential party in the copyright ecosystem, namely libraries. Libraries are not just collectors of knowledge. They're not just reservoirs for books. Libraries are institutions that reflect a convergence of the public good. It is in libraries that we share books, that we, we learn a world in which we can communicate as members and citizens of a democracy along similar lines. Libraries are core, not because they hold books, but because they point us to them. The pandemic has caused massive disruption to our modes of living, forced the closure of schools and libraries and museums and other public interest institutions. During the same uh, uh, meeting at WIPO in, 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 in December 2020, there were calls for the SSCR to adopt the Doha Declaration on Trips and Public Health and to say that exceptions for libraries for users ought to be consistent with the TRIPS public health declaration, the Doha declaration. That declaration, as we know, clarified that the TRIPS agreement could and should be interpreted in a manner supportive of the right to protect public health. But I wanna go one step further, that the Doha declaration certainly like article seven and like article eight points to the capacity to make laws to support public health by making it possible for education to continue in the midst of a public health crisis. But that doesn't solve copyrights public health crisis because the real question is what is our vision of copyright law in the context 
of a world in which massive scaled reproduction and massive access to those reproduced goods are necessary. I think that we could all probably empathize with the publishers, that there's a clear concern that massive access, uncontrolled access will jeopardize their profit, will jeopardize their business model. But is fair use really the place to resolve this tension between copyright's public horizon and the incentive theory that animates the business model of publishers. This is what I call copyright's own internal public health crisis, that the health of the copyright system cannot be dependent on a model of utilitarianism that forces publishers and copyright owners in one direction and users and intermediaries in another, that there must be an overarching purpose for the superpowers that we've given copyright law to help us enable the production of literary works. For this dilemma, Perhaps we need an explicit public health exception that will rid courts of the burden of applying this four-factor test in a case like Internet Archives. Is it time for an explicit public health exception, not just along the lines of the Doha Declaration, but a recognition that the public welfare is intimately connected to the capacity as a collective not just as individuals, to access works and to continue the business of living and flourishing in the midst of a pandemic. In responding to a national public health emergency, the National Emergency Library ended up creating its own emergency for the future of libraries. The stakes are too high to hope that a fair use exception is going to be nimble enough to allow nonprofit institutions to provide digital works for an unlimited amount of people, for an unlimited duration of time, because we are in an age in which it is clear that disruptions of educational endeavors are likely to be on the horizon. Publishers want libraries and users to continue to pay and of course, essentially the public interest is marshaled around the easiest and most expedient capacity for access that we can find. In my view, the court is likely going to recognize that both parties have valid sets of arguments. The utilitarian justification for copyright makes it clear that publishers have a business model that depends on their ability to control copies that are made available to the public and to insist that there be permission before those copies be made available. And when we think about these public health exceptions for copyright, we can see that the current fair use and other kinds of exceptions simply don't address the problems of hybrids, of scale, of transformation, of storage, of recordation. There's an entire new universe that public health pandemics will force us to confront if we're going to take seriously the role of copyright in advancing the public welfare. I think that the court is going to recognize the validity of both sides' arguments in the Internet Archives case. But I think that that recognition means that copyright law is incomplete and in fact may be incompatible to govern public welfare goals in conditions that demand that human life continue in spite of public health hazards. And so perhaps an explicit public health regime for copyright and perhaps all of intellectual property is necessary. As I have recently said, we are now intensely occupied in an effort to remake our sense of collective governance and what human welfare requires politically, economically, and culturally. It is now clear that this effort is happening at the local, national, multilateral, multilateral levels. The virus has reinforced a key feature of our well being, namely that the efficacy of our policies in copyright law to improve human flourishing requires indeed demands forms of law that assume collective engagement 
as the immediate context in which individual pursuits are made possible and even meaningful. Reading a book to yourself during the pandemic, writing a book for yourself during the pandemic is not the vision of copyright law. Copyright law in its organic and in its original and in its most public oriented form recognizes the sheer significance of the need to educate a public to create citizens who not only consume, but also contribute to the fabric of the cultural and political and economic landscape of any society. When copyright rules were written, it was unthinkable that access to physical works would be disrupted for this period of time. An express public health exception would help us avoid bloating fair use as the court had to do in the Hatha Trust case to address an entire collective of individuals with needs for access. I think it's important for us to ask the question, what is it that we are trying to accomplish with copyright law? Is it simply directed at individual utility or are the stakes such that we recognize that the law has an opportunity to provide adequate notice to publishers, to users, to the public institutions to meet us at this most unusual moment. Because as I argue, the, di the variety, diversity, and the scale of need for access to cultural goods is too high for fair use to bear alone. And at the end of the day, it is a collective access that makes possible this thing called public welfare. For that reason, Internet Archive and other institutions and individuals who seek to share and to distribute and to engage with copyrighted works in community should have an exception that meets that very public interest need. Copyright's answer to the eternal question of who is my neighbor who am I going to help in the time of an emergency pandemic? Who am I going to read to? Who am I going to write for? Copyright's answer to this eternal question cannot be that in copyright law, there are no neighbors, only producers and users. Thank you so much. Carolina, can you listen to me? Eh, no sé, es que no la logro. Okay, now, I'm sorry, eh, perdón. Me había bloqueado el muteo, no podía desmutearme. Eh, profesora Ruth. Muchísimas gracias por esta inspiradora conferencia. Eh, realmente estoy todavía pensando un poco por dónde dirigir las preguntas, eh, porque fue como, como un montón de, de conceptos de darle la vuelta a la forma de pensar el derecho de autor supremamente interesante. Llevo un tiempo pensando en... Eh, en mostra mostrar una imagen alemana del siglo XIX en la que en esa imagen aparece la figura de una joven mujer, pero también la figura de una mujer vieja. Cuando uno mira la imagen, lo que ve es a la mujer joven. Debe concentrarse un poco y ve también a la mujer vieja. Ese ejercicio me ha permitido explicar muchas veces que el derecho de autor en la primera mirada es un tema de, de proteccionismo individual, pero que en sí mismo carga la idea del interés público y de lo colectivo. Yo lo veía así, pero la, el relato que usted acaba de hacer 
coincide con esa expresión. Mi pregunta sería, ¿esta comparación funciona bien en Fair Use, pero es todavía más urgente en países como el mío y en regiones, la mayoría del mundo quizá, donde el Fair Use no existe? ¿Cómo, digamos, ¿Cómo podemos analizar ese dilema del que hablabas? Si lo hacemos desde las excepciones y dejamos de lado el fair use, ¿funciona igual? So Carolina, your, I, I couldn't find the English channel, so most of your question um, I missed. Oh my God, I, I then I'll, I'll repeat, I'll repeat. <laughs> No problem. You should Are have you called. sure? I'm so sorry. No, no problem. So I was going to say, I was saying that in the last uh, time, I've mm -hmm. been using um, a, a, an image, a German image of, of 19th century, where you can see the profile of a young woman. That's the first mm -hmm. thing you see. But mm -hmm. if you look well, there's also the profile of an old woman. Mm -hmm. and, and I use it to say you sh that At the first sight, copyright is about individual protectionism. Mm -hmm. But if you look inside, it also has a public interest and the collective mm -hmm. in mind. Mm -hmm. And once you see that, you cannot stop seeing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, of course, the way you, you pose it, you said it, it's, it's much more, it's less literary and more juridical, right? Mm -hmm. Now, my question is that the way you frame it, Uh, matches very well with fair use. But most of the world lives under exceptions and limitations. Does this argument fit the same? If we talk about, I, I would say even worst, but I would like to hear you if the argument is on exceptions and limitations. Thank yeah. you. Yes, no, actually, I think even more. Um, you know, the, the, uh, one of the things that, um, because of time, I didn't want to do a, a very lengthy analysis, but the baseline of copyright has always been, or historically has been the public. And the idea that we um, are carving out limitations and exceptions is, is striking to me, It's in my view, and certainly in the public health context, we should have limitations and exceptions for authors and publishers. And the default should be that the public is able to access, if we really believe that cultural goods and information is the lifeline of society, that this is, it, it, it is information and engagement and interaction that fuels cultural progress, then, It's, it's a very odd system that we have put in place where owners get to control who accesses and then we have a few limitations and exceptions that the rest of the world has to fight over like, a, like, like, like dogs fighting over a bone. Certainly in the pandemic context, it makes sense to use either a liability rule, which looks much more like a public focused rule, especially because as I said in the lecture, um, there is no evidence in copyright law that these exceptions and limitations are meant to address massive access, Ma access at the same time by a lot of people for a lot of things. Copyright law does not have that design. So even fair use and limitations and exceptions in my view, cannot address the situation that we confronted in the midst of a pandemic. Fair use, like limitations and exceptions, has, has limits. It's, it's, it's use by use. It's exception by exception. It's, it's, you, it's unpredictable. It's unstable. It's not fast. And in the context of a public health pandemic, these are the things that you need. But neither of these systems are designed to address the scale at which access was needed and is needed whenever you have a public health crisis. It, it, it just doesn't, 
it, it, it wasn't designed for that. And so in my view, I would not see relying on fair use um, or um, limitations and exceptions as the end of the story. I think we need more. And I think we need more because we're dealing with a kind of access that is not consistent with either limitations and exceptions or fair use. And I think we need more because we need access in these situations because part of that public health issue is people have to be able to share information. They have to be connected as a community they have to make progress as a community. And that means we're really talking about something fundamentally different from fair use or limitations and exceptions. But of course, that's what we have now. So I think that, yes, the answer is, if that's what we're dealing with, we're going to force it into limitations and exceptions. We're going to force it into fair use, just like in the Hathi Trust case. But you can see that that is not the same kind of fair use as we normally think of fair use. And so that's my concern that, that we are overburdening fair use, we are impoverishing copyright, and we may be missing an opportunity to fundamentally change the architecture. That was also a metaphor that I love, the architecture of control. And I would like to uh, pull it a bit, a bit more. Uh, I don't know if you understand my pulley, yeah. you know? Yeah. Okay. And you can speak in <laughs> Spanish. I now have my English translation. I'll use Spanish because we are in, then I'm, I'm shifting to Spanish then. Yeah. yeah. La metáfora de la arquitectura de control es una gran metáfora y quisiera jalarla un poco más. Quisiera, eh, porque es lo que sucedió, digamos, durante la pandemia. En Colombia tengo un caso que creo que, que me sirve para hablar de esto. Un, eh, un cine club de una universidad que lleva funcionando 70 años decide trasladar sus actividades a la red usando, no me acuerdo si Facebook o YouTube, para continuar su trabajo durante la pandemia. Conscientes de los problemas que iban a tener con derecho de autor, escogen un ciclo de películas de dominio público y el streaming se los cortan por violación al derecho de autor. Luego escogen unas películas colombianas y una conversación con productor y director. Tienen los permisos, el streaming se los cortan por derecho de autor. Allí hay una arquitectura de control en donde, como tú decías, incluso el diseño es privado, hay contra, que incluso van más, que importa lo que la ley diga. Particularmente en streaming, donde no hay tiempo, donde se pierde lo que sucede. Un ¿Podrías elaborar un poco más sobre la idea de la arquitectura de control y los retos con las nuevas tecnologías? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Carolina, for that for that question. Um, I, I think that sometimes when we think about the public interest and we talk about limitations and exceptions, we assume that limitations and exceptions are universally good, that they impose no externalities, that they don't harm the public interest, and that they um, should be stretched to accommodate all of the ways in which we might need them. But as I referenced, fair use and all limitations and exceptions are themselves architectures of control because what your example is precisely what I was getting at, that people who want to disseminate, who want to share, who want to be neighbors, who want to be part of a community, who want to, ensure that in the midst of a pandemic, people are able to uh, engage with culture, people are able to learn. All of a sudden, before they, before they engage in any conduct, they're thinking about copyright, and then they're thinking about the exception and the limitation, and then they try to shape their activity to meet or to fit a particular exception or limitation. Sometimes it fits well, sometimes the limitation is too tight, sometimes it's too loose, But we start making arguments that a limitation and exception 
is available and applicable because we're forced to do that as a way of justifying the activity. And that seems to me to be counterproductive to what we think of copyright doing in the public interest. That that's not an argument for a lack of discipline or a lack of exercise of, of, of discretion in, in how we use materials. But when you're thinking about the specific context of an educational institution attempting to continue to educate students in the midst of a public health crisis, or a film studio thinking, how can I serve my community in the midst of a, of, of a difficult time? Let me put some movies on the internet. Let me help parents who are looking for a way. How, how can I be a human contributor? to the public good, to the common good in the midst of this pandemic. If at that stage, a limitation and exception is not available, are we saying that these individuals, these institutions will have no room in the copyright system to operate? Surely that cannot be the case. And we see that one of the challenges with an exceptions and limitations and fair use approach is that what it's doing is affecting our capacity to use in very specific circumstances. It's not affecting the inducement of creativity, it's affecting our ability to use. And so my view is that we need a mechanism and a regime that addresses the level and the intensity and the speed with which decisions are made within communities who are serving the public because of the conditions that have been imposed by COVID-19 or any other pandemic. Can you imagine that um, you, you are FaceTiming and you want to show pictures on FaceTime to your grandchildren um, in order to keep them busy uh, during the day because school has been shut down, are you going to stop and call Copyright Clearance Center to get permission? You're a teacher and you realize that you're unable to access the, 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 the archives because there has been a challenge or the person who was managing it is ill at home um, with COVID. Are you going to shut down your lesson for the day? When technology has made sharing and has made access more feasible, should the law create barriers? to that access. And this is why I'm arguing that I think that neither fair use nor limitations and exceptions are enough. That copyright in its utilitarian justification has limited its own capacity to be a tool that makes it possible in the times of pandemic or public health crises to adapt and to use new technologies to achieve the public good. Thank you. I'm shifting to English because we have a question uh, from Peter Ido. Thank you, Professor Roth, for this excellent and so provocative talk. Would a compulsory license mandatory sharing of copyrighted materials be an alternative or a de facto public exception, especially in the context of materials for research? That is to say, COVID-19 technologies, for example. Yes, I don't think that there's a single bullet. My own view is that a compulsory license or mandatory sharing um, exception may be a long time in coming. Um, it would be negotiated ex ante, which means we are reverting back to the same architecture of control that is a problem today. When I talk about a public health exception, I really mean that. I mean a suspension of the assumption that you cannot use the work and instead an assumption that you can use, that you can share, that you can facilitate access and publishers have to prove an exception to that default. I think that something that allows both qualitative access, dynamic access, justified access, makes more sense because then we at least diminish the tendency to control 
how people are going to respond to the need to continue to have information in the midst of a crisis. The reality is no, there, no one could have ex ante negotiated all of the different things that were needed in order to be copyright compliant during the pandemic. I mean, there was sharing, there was performance, there was translation, there was hybrid, there was in and out. I mean, it was quite something. Every day from, depending on where you were teaching, what part of the world you were in, you didn't know what materials would be available, what would not be available. And so to me, the idea that we can ex ante negotiate the boundaries of use in the context of a pandemic, I think is um, unlikely to be realistic and will just return us to a, a, a feature of the copyright system that is still problematic in my view today. Now, that's so not to say that we can't do other things in addition to a public health exception. I just think that we need something that flips the baseline to one where access is the presumption and not the exception. Thank you very much. Um, so there's another one by Teresa. Thank you for an interesting and thoughtful lecture. In your view, does WIPO provide the best forum opportunity to take discussions on these issues forward? I will add, or is there any forum, any other forum we can address? I am, I, I'm sorry we're keeping you a few more minutes, but everybody is glad doing so. So I will keep yeah. you a few more. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that WIPO has to be involved. I'm not sure that WIPO is the best place to do this. In part, because if you look at the WIPO treaties, we do not have any WIPO treaty except the Marrakesh Treaty, but no general intellectual property treaty has the kind of preamble and the kind of objectives and principles and established jurisprudence that we already have in the WTO. And so if we're going to build on, on, on the foundation that's already there, we may find that the WTO is a more hospitable environment in which to do so. I do think that WIPO can play a role and WIPO should play a role. And many times the discussions in WIPO are helpful in framing the question for the WTO. It's just unclear to me that, WIPO's, that WIPO is going to play a major role in this setting because the political dynamics at WIPO, I think make it harder. And it's history as an institution whose constitution is committed to the strengthening of intellectual property rights. Um, I, I just think that the DNA of the, of the organization is not as suited um, for the kind of um, considerations that a public health exception might require. The WTO has many, many analogies, many, many analogs to this. We have many exceptions to trade laws. This is an environment in which exceptions and independent regimes for health, the, phytos the PTS, the PSP, the phytosanitary um, uh, measures, uh, uh, we have Doha, we just have a, a culture in which there's a recognition that um, flexibility in, at the national stage is necessary for public health uh, reasons. And I think that may make me tilt a little more slightly towards the WTO. So final, a final one, I hope. <laughs> How can we take advantage of the momentum brought by the pandemic and avoiding that the back to normal will justify the commonly use of copyrights? We are assuming that the we are assuming the risk to create a specific standards mm -hmm. that, that would be only useful in exceptional Excellent. circumstances or context. So how to make these changes the new standards? Excellent. Excellent. X, that's a great question. And it's one that I have that, that concerns me quite a bit. So thank you, whoever asked that question. Because Guillermo Rodriguez Corredor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it's really important for us to recognize that there can, this idea of a one type of copyright fits all situations um, should, should just come to an end. 
I do think that we need a very clear regime for public health pandemics, because those are situations in which everybody has to stay home. Um, we're communicating almost exclusively through machines, and there aren't really many options for, um, for anything else. But I also think that what we're dealing with fundamentally is a reorienting of copyright. That in order to create an explicit public health exception for copyright, we need to recognize that copyright as it is currently justified, justified makes it difficult to accomplish the kind of community and collective goals that education, health, cultural participation, civic democracy requires. And to me, that means that we have to begin to do what the judge did in Hathi Trust and to say, we cannot imagine a world in which copyright law would actually prohibit a library like Internet Archives from making works available during an emergency. What kind of world is that? We can't imagine a world where the only way to use copyright is one by one, on a one by one basis. And I think that once we begin to back away from these individualistic ad hoc determinations of exceptions and limitations, we force a reorientation of copyright law in its entirety. We, we have to begin to think about what is it that makes it possible for copyright law to be legitimized as a tool of protection and not a tool of dissemination. That fundamental issue has to be on the table and it has to be one that allows us to reframe the question and reframe copyrights orientation to think about distribution, participation, collective engagement as part of what the system must and can do if we are to take public welfare seriously. Muchísimas gracias, Ruth. Muy amable por acompañarnos, por haber aceptado la invitación este año. Eh, yo espero que el siguiente Global Congress sea presencial. Este tendría que haber sucedido en Cartagena el año pasado, al lado del mar. Pero bueno, estamos desde nuestras casas y te agradecemos eh, muchísimo que nos hayas acompañado. Eh, creo que es una conferencia para seguir pensando. Yo al menos me quedaré pensando en si un cambio de paradigma como el que propones eh, se ha dado y existe algún, si, algún régimen o de jurídico que en el pasado haya hecho esa voltereta, eh, sería muy interesante aprender del tema. Muchas gracias Ruth y por favor te dejo para que te despidas. Thank you so much to everyone who listened and who joined in. I think the only thing that I would add um, is when we had a development crisis, as many, many, many countries became independent um, at uh, the end of the 1960s and early 1970s, we had to create entirely new regimes to accommodate them. When we came to the end of a terrible world war, World War II, we had to create international institutions to address the new environment in which we lived. It is not impossible, it is not implausible, and it is not infeasible or impracticable to imagine copyright returning to what it was meant to do, to promote progress, to advance both individual and collective well-being. And in the end, copyright will remain true to itself if it can do that regardless of the conditions in which we live.